let's look at architecture strategy now. Architecture strategy is perhaps one of the most attractive uh, areas uh, of entrepreneurial strategy, or seemingly so. I mean, after all, if you can have a market you can control, and you have a market where you um, have effectively uh, uh, built everything from the ground up, that seems like a good way to go. However, as you can imagine, there are risks and other things that may make this not attractive at all. So as I said, architectural strategy is where you orientate yourself towards competing with existing value chains, perhaps where none existed at all, and you uh, invest in control, whether it be through intellectual property protection or other things that make it harder for people to compete with you in the future. Of course, as with all of these strategies, there's a constellation of the four choices that ends up comprising architecture. Uh, with regard to competition, it's obviously by definition, orientation towards competition and investment in control. For customers, you're looking for providing customers of value with very novel new uh, combinations. So it's invariably satisfying very new needs that happens here. With regard to technology, you are invariably going to be on a new S curve, not on old S curves and exploiting some new technological trajectory relative to what people have done in the past. And in terms of your identity, well, this is the world of zero to one, where you're creating something out of nothing and you're going to have internal capabilities that are going to give you lots of insights into different stakeholders and the ability to coordinate them. In terms of your external positioning, you are architecting an entirely new value chain. And in terms of the ecosystem, you are often the foundational partner, the foundational cornerstone of that ecosystem. In terms of your value creation hypothesis, you want to coordinate and you want to integrate the entire value chain. So can you actually do those things and still provide value? And in terms of the value capture hypothesis, are you going to be in a position to be able to capture value within that new value chain into the future? And so this will bear on questions such as the degree of openness uh, that you might have if you, say, have a platform or something like that. What's an example of this sort of architectural strategy? Airbnb is a classic one. Airbnb, yes, they're often seen as disruptive, but that's according to old definitions, not the definitions we're using here. Instead, Airbnb took a whole lot of things that were not currently being utilized and built an entire value chain to unlock essentially people's homes for the purposes of temporary accommodation. This had not been done. We had had at one extreme, we had had uh, rental markets. I look at a continuum here, one extreme. We've got rental, you know, rent, renting. And at the other extreme, we had, of course, uh, hotels. Okay, that was your temporary accommodation. Renting was your long-term accommodation, which relied, renting invariably relied on, allowed individual landlords to occur, come into play. But what Airbnb did is it said, well, why can't we have a bit of both? And so combined the two notions using, you know, mobile technologies, digital technologies, and matching. And got them all together. And so found that new opportunity. So serving a whole lot of needs, both on the supply side, unlocking these assets, and on the demand side, allowing you uh, to uh, appeal to customer classes who did not fall easily into these other mixes. A very interesting business model indeed. But it's architectural strategy because Airbnb are competing with this, not so much with that, so there's competition here, 
of an existing value chain, and Airbnb are oriented towards control. Why are they oriented towards control? Because they're building up a platform which allows them which allows them to foreclose or stop competition in the future. Okay? Because people come for Airbnb because it's easy to find properties and search for properties on the market so they have liquidity. Lots of buyers and sellers. And that's how you ensure yourself the future there. Twitter is another example of a company to the extent that it has a, a strategy at all, which by the way is debatable. What Twitter have done is uh, Twitter have created an entirely new value chain. Okay, so their new value chain is, of course, typical for these things a social network, or some might say a communications protocol. protocol Protocol. <laughs> and they are competing with other forms of communication in that regard. Uh, and But they're different. They're different in lots of ways. They're different in the short messages, etc. But if Twitter go very well, what they do is they build up uh, value. Um, they build up a, value, a new value chain and they build up network effects. because they've got lots of users. A network effect arises when the value of me using something increases if other people are using it. And that's definitely true of Twitter. Okay, so they get this competition effect here and they've got a control effect coming out of the, the value, uh, to, coming out of net network effects. How they make money is still a big question mark. In the past, we've had other companies that have evolved into uh, companies that have uh, uh, ended up having an architectural strategy. <laughs> now, obviously, with regard to Lego, it's very tempted to take this little brick and think about that as architecture right there because you put them together and you build a little house. But that's not what I'm talking about here. What's interesting about Lego is it started off with a product and then had the idea later on to move into a platform or what they called were a system because they tried to make all of these bricks interoperable. Now that gave rise to an interesting economy of scope in that if you had some Lego pieces, there was a value to you having more Lego pieces. And so that is where they ended up having some measure of control. And they've been a very, very successful product. So, you have this new value chain. It's often the case that with that new value chain, you're using a platform for control. A platform is a business that brings together two groups or more groups, group one, group two. We see platforms all, all over the place. We see them in media, where the two groups are advertisers and readers. We see them in search, where it's again advertisers and uh, users coming in. We see them in things like credit cards, where we've got merchants and we've got consumers uh, coming in there, and we see them in other things, such as uh, dating networks, where sometimes the two groups are distinct, men versus women, sometimes they may be the same. Why not? Here's something for you to review later on, some more details about architectural strategy, including some of the firms that have engaged in architectural strategy in the past. And 
as I said, in architecting a product-driven value chain, you may use several things to give yourself control. Henry Ford here with the Model T used economies of scale, that is, to be able to produce at lower, lower costs if you had higher and higher volumes. Dell relied on economies of scope, being able to have a lot of customizable different products coming off the same uh, uh, scheme. And uh, the body shop, uh, architected on the basis of differentiation, placing themselves outside of the normal cosmetic selling with a whole lot of different uh, differences there, but with a retail network that allowed themselves to build on one another. And you can get, you can get uh, architectural strategy that way too. In terms of choosing your customers, you're going to focus on defined value creation for novel customer combinations. The quintessential example of this is, of course, this company, The Facebook, later to be known as just Facebook, as the uh, movie famously uh, depicted. Uh, and it started in an interesting way. You'll notice that it started small. It started with defined local groups, uh, particular members to a particular community, and it expanded from there. And it took quite a few years for Facebook to expand. And so, you know, in contrast to the normal perceptions of you have to move very fast and build up market share, Facebook actually did not do that as part of their architectural strategy. They chose very targeted initial customers uh, basically at colleges, then to high schools, uh, and then to countries, and, and so on and so forth. And that's how they built up the effects they did. So don't think that architecture means you're doing everything. You're going around to all customers. You still have to focus, focus, focus. We similarly have similar architectural strategies arising in the dating market. Uh, we've got, you know, Match.com, eHarmony, Tinder... Uh, Tinder is, of course, um, owned by Match.com. Uh, JDate, uh, you know, some specialized ones. I'm, I'm sure there are other sites as well. This is uh, after my time. And the other site, things like Grindr. And all these sites are basically getting the benefits of liquidity. I use that term in the financial sense, but basically you're going to want to join these sites if you have a chance of being matched. So it's the obvious example of a design problem. But some of these ones choose very different strategies. Match.com was very mass market. eHarmony focused on um, long-term relationships. That's why they have, you know, like a, a three-hour application process to sign up. Tinder, on the other hand, does not. Okay, it's a different segment, different targeted customers. So you're still targeting customers, even though you are trying to architect an entire new value chain. In terms of the technology, you invariably build your value chain or ecosystem around a new technology. For instance, OpenTable. OpenTable uh, built their technology, uh, built their entire uh, uh, reservation system around mobile devices. That was a new technology there. So, you know, you can see this sort of thing occur. This hadn't been done before. They exploited that opportunity and uh, obviously have done very well. At it. In terms of choosing your competition, you are going to orientate towards competition and invest in control. A great example of this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg, Michael Bloomberg there, is seen in his younger days, before he was became mayor of New York, etc. Uh, he uh, um, saw a need to provide information to financial traders and came up with the Bloomberg terminals that are still used today and that people rely upon and built off of that. Uh, and it was very competitive and can charge a lot for it and has had very few uh, competitors into the future. Finally, in terms of choosing your identity, uh, invariably what you're trying to do is find a monopoly uh, outcome. This is Peter Tile. He founded Palantir. 
and Palantir is uh, in the position of aggregating data uh, to sell to very cu various customers, including the government, uh, the US government, uh, and it's done very well. But if you read Peter Taylor's work about what makes a good entrepreneurial strategy, he says, you know, you don't want to find a place where you're going to compete, a la our execution-oriented strategies. You want to find places where you are going to be able to monopolize the market. Okay, so he sees that as zero to one. More than one is bad. More than one is bad. Something to think about. Okay, so this is the architectural strategy. The architectural strategy is very attractive. For many years, this was the thing that we advocated people to look for <laughs> as a part of, uh, you know, entrepreneurial strategy. Look for these areas where you can get a monopoly and control it, etc. Now, it's not the only way to make money. It's often very risky. It's often got a lot of competition up front to try and get the prize at the end. And moreover, it can be overridden by good execution at that initial time as well. So architectural strategy is an option though. And if it can be done, it can certainly prove very lucrative as some of the most successful companies have shown. It's just a difficult path there and it may not be easy, feasible, or whatever, the resources you have initially.